Libertarians, though perhaps too few of us, often say that the absolutely most important issue for them is foreign policy. For many of us, especially recent generations, this is the touchstone subject that either converted us to libertarianism or made us into radicals, maybe both. Surely all of us are familiar, though, with the most common response to libertarian visions of foreign affairs. The United States is an exceptional nation with an indispensable role to play in the world. Well, we've toyed with the concept of exceptionalism before, and now Cato's own Vice President for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies, Chris Preble, joins us to discuss U.S. foreign policy in its broad scope. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. So the revolutionary and the founding generation, they are uh, famed for having read their history thoroughly yes. and very well. Yes. Uh, they In the were, original Greek. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> many of them at least, yes, right? Yes. Yeah. And... Uh, they, they were very familiar with history, English history, ancient history. It meant a lot to them. And I think there was a real sense that they were making history, uh, that they were agents of change for the world yes. and its course. Uh, could you explain to us how the revolutionary and the founding generations thought of themselves as agents of history. Absolutely. Um, and thanks for having me, Anthony. Uh, I think that they had a very clear sense that the world was watching, or at least they wanted the world to be watching. And you see this, you know, in Declaration of Independence and the, and, you know, a decent respect for the opinions of mankind. They, they were fashioning a new system, a new political system and they were so determined to to be different from the you know kings and princes of of, of their uh, ancestors, um, and one of the key themes that emerges uh, all along is this uh, sense that uh, preparing for war or or you know having to arm to defend oneself. Uh, was uh, a vehicle for the growth of the state, uh, and they so they were very, you know. Again, they're not naive. They they recognized that they needed to actually uh, fight to secure their their um, independence from from Great Britain, um, but they were always mindful that that could get out of control, and so they were. Um, and and so they, they they were just constantly struggling with this, right? They were they were very, uh, for example, famously sort of wary of uh, permanent standing armies. Uh, on the other hand, they recognized their their need. So it really was a balancing act right, right from the very beginning. There was, in you know, to go along with their sort of in, enlightenment uh, uh, study of history. Um, they also had a powerful sense of religious mission that was yes. long rooted yes. in American history. Right? Uh, how does how does the sense of mission interact with this sense of history? Well, they absolutely did have a sense of history. We, as historians, have have sort of looked backwards a bit too much, perhaps, and sort of famously reached back to um, John Winthrop's speech in which he talks about the city on a hill. Uh, it's not obvious that, that the founders were as aware of Winthrop as we were, but they had a general sense that, that by creating something like a new Jerusalem, like a new uh, promised land, that that would be an example to others. And, and so um, they that that's part of why they wanted to to be different, to not just be um, l a better version of the predecessors, but something that was that was founded on on core principles of um, of individual liberty and freedom. Again, you know, there are multiple sort of problems and contradictions, you know, not the least of which is slavery and things like that. But there were obviously um, some uh, key. Uh, f differences in terms of how they organize themselves politically uh, and the importance of um, citizen representation and and all those sorts of things. Now it seems if you if you mix a religious sense of mission mm -hmm. with 
an Enlightenment, liberal, secular study of history, you might well get something that turns out to look a lot like 19th century manifest destiny. Right. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, the sense that history itself is doing yes. the mission making, not, not necessarily God, although, yes. you know, by the time of manifest destiny in the 1840s, plenty of people, uh, perhaps even more people than in the revolutionary generation had this revived religious uh, sense of mission guiding them. But but let's talk about foreign policy then since your book is all about foreign policy. Let's talk about foreign policy in the early republic after uh, independence has been secured from Britain mm -hmm. and Americans now do have this unique opportunity to enter into the national stage. Right. Uh, what do they do with it? Well, the first thing they do, of course, is after the revolution and and after you know winning victory in the war, they stumble along for a little while under the Articles of Confederation. And one of the key sort of factors driving the move to to create a, a stronger and uh, federal state was a concern about foreign threats. Uh, in particular, of course, they worried about the individual states fighting with one another. They worried about internal rebellion as a as a threat to uh, the individual states less capable. And so there's no question that part of the rationale for the Constitution is is driven by uh, fears of, of foreign threats and the ability of foreign states to sort of pick these, these individual states apart one by one and set them against one another. Um, but it's also true that um, you know, with from Washington on down, uh, that they that once they had created this more perfect union, right, a, 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 the more a tighter union of states, they still wanted very much for the United States to remain separate as much as possible from the disputes of the European powers. Yes, they relied upon in in the case of the you know the French for the revolution, and then there was obviously a lot of tension between how much to ally with the French versus the British in the um, in the early early days of you know the early republic um, but they also but they were equally committed to trade as an engine for not just prosperity but also for good relations with other countries so i think even in the very early days you see this this willingness to interact with others and a real wariness uh, of being drawn into other people's fights yeah you know it it struck me while you were saying that that this is how Douglas North won his Nobel Prize right by well or I wasn't it for for his work on economic history I, right I think that's right yeah. I think so that yeah. that book on on uh, early American economic history where he said it was it was trade that that built the American economy at least it was the basis correct for the kinds of investments in an industry that that boomed it later mm -hmm. and you know if you have essentially a, a second rate power uh, trying to get wealthier or a you know in the the case of north he was saying this is a model for the third world today the so, right. so called Correct. third world yes. the developing yeah, right. world developing world we were a developing country obviously in the early days and we behaved like a developing country yeah it's this this ragtag second rate power uh trying to maintain its very newly won independence from these great globe spanning empires right uh, the the greatest power the world had seen from the the British Empire, and its politics, it's even domestic politics in the 1790s, are basically dictated by this conflict between Britain and France. Correct. This is this is something that comes through. It comes through quite clearly in in Washington's farewell address, but you see it in other ways as well. They were so concerned about attachments to foreign countries tearing the country apart and and there was definitely a fear and, and a legitimate you know a legitimate fear about that in the in the late uh, 1700s uh, precisely because of this dispute between uh, Britain and, and France um, but those those concerns persisted and I think again the ability of the United States to to form together in union um, depended upon individual members of you know sort of citizens republicans small r um to to be so focused on on the us uh position and improving uh, oneself uh, improving the country without having to rely on a foreign protector or a foreign patron right it was about reciprocity and and dealing equally with as many countries as possible now uh <laughs> dealing with as many countries as possible i was i was about to ask you uh i would i would consider um 
the American dealings with Native Americans mm -hmm. uh, a matter of foreign policy. Yes. But that is not, generally speaking, how people at the time treated it. Correct. Uh, especially after independence when these are considered, you know, dependent peoples basically within the jurisdiction of the United States. Uh, did anybody at the time consider that uh, a, a, you know, their interactions with the Indians, a interaction with a foreign people or or did was this this idea of indians as dependence on this new nation was was that around in the 1790s it's a really good question while I washington mean, it, was still destroying towns it's a really good question obviously there were there were moments in early american history in the colonial era where um the various native american nations were were dealt with as um as sometime allies, right? And and the British did this as well, and the French did this. It was you know a fair amount of um, realpolitik and dealing with these various uh, various groups. I do think eventually the U the American government's position towards the Native Americans shifted uh, away from seeing them as sovereign uh, peoples uh, to dependents. I can't really say I, I can't really say where we would fix on that particular time when that occurred, but certainly by uh, by well, one of the great I mean, let me back up for a minute because one of the great ironies, and I talk about this in the book, is that um, w one of the grievances that the colonists had against the British was the line of control, which basically prevented uh, the the U European, mostly British settlers, from moving farther west. Uh, again, partly because the British had made certain promises to the, to the Native Americans who had cooperated with them against the French in, in Seven Years' War, as we know, the French and Indian War. And so, so after after the Revolution and after Independence. Um, the Native American tribes would certainly have looked upon the American uh, colonists as, as more rapacious and aggressive colonizers than the British were. Um, and so that's one of, the, one of those ironies uh, of American history. And of course, I, I think you're absolutely right that in the, in, the, in the course of the 19th century, as the United States expanded from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific, um, those those actions would look to any other outside observer as as though it were foreign policy. And I think um, as a historian of U.S. history, um, I think event, over time, historians have come to that point of view. I don't think the American people, many of them think of it that way. But it comes up today in the present era because people compare – um, for example, U.S. involvement in Afghanistan as, in Iraq as synonymous with U.S. involvement against the Sioux or the Cherokee. And I think that's just – that's apples and radiators. It's not even apples to, to, to oranges. It's, it's so different. Um, and I, I do try to talk about that a little bit in the book. It's about, you know, how you define your security perimeter, what's required to be secure and prosperous. Um, and, you know, it's at least a debatable proposition that the United States could have tolerated um, a, um, an independent sovereign people who would always be at risk or there would always be a danger that those independent sovereign people could ally with a foreign power or something like that. Uh, and I think that's a lot of what drove American expansion, territorial expansion uh, throughout the 19th century. Now, the most famous American Indian warrior is no doubt uh, Andrew Jackson. Yes. But John Quincy Adams. Who really... I don't think makes an appearance in this book, and no. that's probably not by accident. <laughs> but but John not Quincy Adams, not a libertarian. Oh no no no. <laughs> but but it was John Quincy Adams that really started the Indian removal policy True. that that Jackson was so famous for yes. uh, implementing, along with with Van Buren. Um, but Adams is also probably the best representative of the strain of enlightenment that you were talking about earlier yes. and the this this uh, special american reverence for uh republicanism and for especially their independence from britain as a world changing event uh and this is going to be our our first document here and i wondered if you could just set it up for us by telling us a bit about adams and his position in the United States and his position in the world. Right. Because he, he was an exceptionally worldly American. <laughs> he was. He was an exceptionally worldly American. A person who as a very young man 
was sent uh, with his father, uh, you know, as initially sort of as a personal secretary to his father, as an emissary to to England, to to Europe as the war is going on, and then sent to Saint Petersburg. Um, uh, so this was a man who, before he completed high school, would have had more diplomatic experience than nearly anyone, you know, um, twice or three times his age, even. Um, and and he just sort of continued in that in that mo uh, mode um, throughout early adulthood. And so by the time um, he gives this famous speech in 1821 on July 4th, um, he, he was already well established uh, as, uh, as a philosopher, as a statesman, um, and of course had been or was, was at the time serving as uh, Monroe's Secretary of State. He had secured recently um, a, a treaty with uh, has his name on it, the Adams on East Treaty that that's basically resolved um, Spanish Florida as an American possession, um, and uh, you know so so he did have a, a unique standing um, by the time he gave this speech, and then it was several years later, of course, he'd be elected president in his own right. I had I was aware of this speech. Um, it has been elements of this speech have been used over and over again, um, it was sort of famously invoked by George Kennan in a, a, a article in Foreign Affairs many years ago, but just the one small part, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Um, when I finally had a chance to read this speech in its entirety, um, it it is, it is practically life changing. I mean, this man, he was obviously entertaining an audience and this was a, you know, this is what they did back then, right? They gave speeches and they listened to speeches and that was part of it. But it's, it's so rich. There's so much more to this talk uh, than just that famous line. And I encourage everyone who hasn't had a chance uh, to, to give it a second look or maybe a first look for many people. Fellow citizens, until within a few days before that which we have again assembled to commemorate our fathers, the people of the Union had constituted a portion of the British nation, a nation renowned in the arts and arms, who from a small island in the Atlantic Ocean had extended their dominion over considerable parts of every quarter of the globe, governed themselves by a race of kings whose title to sovereignty had originally been founded on conquest, spellbound for a succession of ages under that portentous system of despotism and of superstition which in the name of the meek and humble jesus had been spread over the christian world the history of this nation had for a period of seven hundred years from the days of the conquest till our own exhibited a conflict almost continued between the oppressions of power and the claims of right in the theories of the crown and the mitre man had no rights neither the body nor the soul of the individual was his own from the impenetrable gloom of this intellectual darkness and the deep degradation of this servitude, the British nation had partially emerged. The martyrs of religious freedom had consumed to ashes at the stake. The champions of temporal liberty had bowed their heads upon the scaffold, and the spirits of many a bloody day had left their earthly vesture upon the field of battle and a sword to plead the cause of liberty before the throne of heaven. Through long ages of civil war, the people of Britain had extorted from their tyrants not acknowledgments but grants of right. With this concession, they had been content to stop in the progress of human improvement. They received their freedom as a donation from their sovereigns. They appealed for their privilege to a signed manual and a seal. They held their title to liberty, like their title to lands, from the bounty of a man in their moral and political chronology. The greater charter of Runnymede was the beginning of the world. Fellow citizens, it was in the heat of this war of moral elements which brought on Stuart to the block and hurled another from his throne, that our forefathers sought refuge from its fury in the then wilderness of this western world. They were willing exiles from a country dearer to them than life, but they were the exiles of liberty and of conscience, dearer to them even than their country. They came too with charters from their kings, for even in removing another hemisphere, they cast longing, lingering looks behind and were anxiously desirous of retaining ties of connection with their country, which in the solemn compact of a charter, they hoped by the corresponding links of allegiance and protection to persevere. But to their sense of right, the charter was only the ligament between them, their country, and their king. Transported to a new world, 
They had relations with one another and relations with the aboriginal inhabitants of the country to which they came, for which no royal charter could provide. The first settlers of the Plymouth colony, at the eve of landing from their ship, therefore bound themselves together by a written covenant, and immediately after landing purchased from the Indian natives the right of settlement upon the soil. Thus was a social compact formed upon the elementary principles of civil society, in which conquest and servitude had no part. The slew of brutal force was entirely cast off. All was voluntary. All was unbiased consent. All was the agreement of soul with soul. Other colonies were successfully founded, and other charters granted until in the compass of a century and a half, thirteen distinct British provinces peopled the Atlantic shores of the North American continent with two millions of freemen possessing by their charters the rights of British subjects, and nurtured by their position and education in the more comprehensive and original doctrines of human rights. From their infancy they had been treated by the parent state with neglect, harshness, and injustice. Their charters had often been disregarded and violated, their commerce restricted and shackled, their interest wantonly or spitefully sacrificed, so that the hand of the parent had been scarcely ever felt but in the alternate application of whips and scorpions, when in spite of all these persecutions by the natural vigor of their constitution, they were just attaining the maturity of political manhood, a British parliament in contempt of the clearest maxims of natural equity, in defiance of the fundamental principle upon which British freedom itself had been cemented with British blood, on the naked unblushing allegation of absolute and uncontrollable power undertook by their act to levy without representation and without consent, taxes upon the people of America for the benefit of the people of Britain. This enormous project of public robbery was no sooner made known than excited throughout the colonies one general burst of indignant resistance. It was abandoned, reasserted, and resumed until fleets and armies were transported to record in the characters of fire, famine, and desolation the transatlantic wisdom of British legislation and the tender mercies of British consanguinity. It will be acted o'er fellow citizens, but it can never be repeated. It stands and must forever stand alone, a beacon on the summit of the mountain, to which all the inhabitants of the earth may turn their eyes for a genial and saving light, till time shall be lost in eternity, and this globe itself dissolve, nor leave a wreck behind. It stands forever, a light of admonition to the rulers of men, a light of salvation and redemption to the oppressed, so long as this planet shall be inhabited by human beings, so long as man shall be of social nature, so long as government shall be necessary to the great moral purposes of society, and so long as it shall be abused to the purposes of oppression, so long shall this declaration hold out to the sovereign and to the subject the extent and boundaries of their respective rights and duties, founded in the laws of nature and of nature's God. Five and forty years have passed away since this declaration was issued by our fathers, and here are we, fellow citizens, assembled in the full enjoyment of its fruits, to bless the author of our being for the counties of his providence, in casting our lot in this favored land, to remember with effusions of gratitude the sages who put forth, and the heroes who bled for the establishment of this declaration, and by the communion of soul in the reperusal and hearing of this instrument, to renew the genuine holy alliance of its principles, to recognize them as eternal truths, and to pledge ourselves and bind our posterity to a faithful and undeviating adherence to them. In the progress of forty years since the acknowledgment of our independence, we have gone through many modifications of internal government and through all the vicissitudes of peace and war with other mighty nations, but never, never for a moment, have the great principles consecrated by the declaration of this day been renounced or abandoned. And now, friends and countrymen, if the wise and learned philosophers of the older world, the first observers of the mutation and aberration, the discoverers of maddening ether and invisible planets, the inventors of congreve rockets and shrapnel shells, should find their hearts disposed to inquire, what has America done for the benefit of mankind? Let our answer be this. America, with the same voice which spoke herself into existence as a nation, proclaimed to mankind the inextinguishable rights of human nature and the only lawful foundations of government. America, in the assembly of nations since her admission among them, has invariably, though often fruitlessly, held forth to them the hand of honest friendship, of equal freedom, 
of generous reciprocity. She has uniformly spoken among them, though often to heedless and often to disdainful ears, the language of equal liberty, equal justice, and equal rights. She has, in the lapse of nearly half a century, without a single exception, respected the independence of other nations while asserting and maintaining her own. She has abstained from interference in the concerns of others, even when the conflict has been for principles to which she clings as to the last vital drop that visits the heart. She has seen that probably for centuries to come, all the contests of the European world will be contests between inveterate power and emerging right. Wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been, or shall be unfurled, there will be her heart, her benedictions, and her prayers be. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. She will recommend the general cause by the countenance of her voice, and the benignant sympathy of her example. She well knows that by once enlisting under other banners than her own, were they even the banners of foreign independence, she would involve herself beyond the power of extrication in all the wars of interest and intrigue, of individual avarice, envy, and ambition, which assume the colors and usurp the standard of freedom. The fundamental maxims of her policy would insensibly change from liberty to force. The frontlet upon her brows would no longer beam with the ineffable splendor of freedom and independence, but in its stead would soon be submitted an imperial diadem flashing in false and tarnished luster the murky radiance of dominion and power she might become dictatoress of the world she would be no longer the ruler in her own spirit stand forth ye champions of britannia ruler of the waves stand forth ye chivalrous knights of chartered liberties and the rotten borough enter the lists ye boaster of inventive genius ye mighty masters of the palette and the brush come and inquire what has america done for the benefit of mankind in the half-century which has elapsed since the Declaration of American Independence, what have you done for the benefit of mankind? We shall not contend with you for the prize of music, painting, or sculpture. We shall not disturb to the ecstatic trances of your chemists, nor call from the heavens the ardent gaze of your astronomers. We will not ask you who was the last president of your Royal Academy. We will not inquire by whose mechanical combinations it was that your steamboats stemmed the currents of your rivers and vanquished the opposition of the winds themselves upon your seas. We will not name the inventor of the cotton gin, for we fear that you would ask us the meaning of the word and pronounce it a provincial barbarism. We will not name to you him whose graver defies the imitation of forgery and saves the labor of your executioner by taking from your greatest geniuses of robbery the power of committing the crime. He is now among yourselves, and since your philosophers have permitted him to prove to them the compressibility of water, you may perhaps claim him for your own. Would you soar to fame upon a rocket, or burst into glory from a shell? We shall leave you to inquire of your naval heroes their opinion of the steam battery and the torpedo. It is not by the contrivance of agents of destruction that America wishes to commend her inventive genius to the admiration or the gratitude of after times nor is it even by the detection of the secrets or the composition of new modifications of physical nature. Her glory is not dominion, but liberty. Her march is the march of mind. She has a spear and a shield, but the motto upon her shield is freedom, independence, peace. This has been her declaration. This has been, as far as her necessary intercourse with the rest of mankind would permit, her practice. Now, one of the most famous events of the 1820s, this sounds very bizarre to us today perhaps, but one of the most famous events was Lafayette's uh, uh, his famous return tour return, to yeah. the United States Yeah, after independence. Sure. It had been 50 years since, since independence was declared and Lafayette uh, was returning to uh, – party <laughs> from, on, on a giant tour around around the United States uh, and people turned out in huge numbers to see him and to, to hear him speak and just to, to celebrate with him. Can you give us a sense of how Americans are thinking about themselves and their place in the world, say from the 1820s sure. on to the 1840s? Sure. Well, I think that um, <laughs> it's absolutely true that after 
um, after the Second War of the British, with the British, the War of 1812, uh, they were feeling pretty good about themselves and sort of wind at their backs. Um, and, you know, the world is our oyster, whatever term you want to use, whether, whether a cliche. Um, but there was also hanging over them a, a sense of um, the, the danger that could come from within, right? The danger of um, uh, slavery in particular and, and, and um, slave power and this concern about maintaining a balance in the political order. Um, and again, Adams, John Quincy Adams was so critical in that during the 1820s. Um, but, but I think there was this desire to sort of want to believe the, the best that this country could possibly be. Um, and yet in the background was sort of the, always this nagging sense uh, that, that uh, danger was just around the corner. But the danger wasn't coming from outside. The danger was coming from within. One of, one of the most interesting things I've found too is that there's there's also – there's almost this this desperate political rhetoric to try to ramp up the British yes. as as still this juggernaut yes. that we have to fear. Right. But it, it, it doesn't really take hold no. too deeply. Right. Uh, no. I mean look, this is a common – Pat practice, right, is that in order to maintain cohesion at home, you invoke fear uh, from abroad um, or from the other. Um, now, again, uh, you know, concern about um, uh, threats within the continental United States from the Native American tribes could be, could represent that sort of threat, and especially along the communities along the uh, you know on the fringes, so to speak, or along the frontier. But but in terms of a a, a large enough and a scary enough threat to maintain cohesion in, more, in the more settled places, that was still Great Britain uh, to, a, to a large extent. Um, and, and I, but I think you're right. I think it didn't, it didn't take in the same way that it, that it did in the, in, the, uh, 18, in the early 1800s. Of course, there were also these interesting, as we've covered a lot on the show, there were these interesting dynamics where a lot of the folks are, who were anti-war, for example, in the Mexican War, opposed annexing Texas and going to war with Mexico because they didn't want to agitate the slavery issue between Correct. the sections That's and exactly disrupt right. this awful gentleman's agreement not to bring it up. That's right. So that you know they knew it would people like Calhoun knew it would disrupt the political class. Uh, so he he didn't want a war with Mexico if it could be avoided. Right. Of course he didn't have the heart to oppose it once it had started. Uh, but you know what what do you say about that? That there's there's also even in the anti-war streak, there's not necessarily the best of reasons. Oh, absolutely it. right. I mean, I think, and this is a this is a theme that is is definitely um, sort of comes up again and again over the course of the the nineteenth century. That that on the one hand, you have uh, this sense that. Um, the political order is fairly uh, stable, as you say, a sort of gentleman's agreement. Let's not upset the apple cart. On the other hand, from a foreign policy perspective and from a, from a security perspective, you are trying to identify ways to push out the boundaries of the, the state as a, as a buffer to drive out possible challengers, possible threats. And that's what impels to a considerable extent the drive all the way to the Pacific, right? It's just like push off of the continental United States or push down um, Mexico as a, as a potential threat. But that bumps up against the political dynamic, which as you noted, if you expand this territory west and south, it is almost certain to be slave states. And so it comes up over and over again. What I was fascinated by, it was one of the first times I'd really looked at this, David Mayers wrote a terrific book about sort of at various stages in American history, the dissenters, the dissenters against expansion. And, and what struck me was I was aware of the slavery argument and the politics of it. Um, but Mayers makes the point that there was also a sense that this noble experiment depended upon a small state and that small state couldn't stay small or it would be difficult for that stall, small state to remain limited if the actual expanse of the territory continued to grow. And this came up even in what most people agree is sort of like, well, 
a slam dunk, right, was the Louisiana Purchase. Even the Louisiana Purchase, the question was, for, the, for a handful of dissenters, the question was, how on earth are we going to maintain a small state that is respectful of individual liberties when we've doubled, more than doubled the size of our territory? And this comes up over and over and over again. So I do think you're absolutely right that the, the, the politics of slavery was always an issue, at least through the end of the 19th century. But there was also this sense that that uh, there was tension between a, a classical liberal limited state, enumerated powers, um, and one that that could, whenever it felt like it, grow its its actual remit, right, to actually grow the extent of the territory under its control. Now, I also think that the politics of slavery tend to swallow the narrative of yes, that time period. Yes, absolutely right. Yep. And even when foreign policy comes up in, say, the 1850s or uh, the 1860s, when it's you know not about the Civil War, foreign policy seems to be about the Southerners' attempts to purchase Cuba mm -hmm. or you know other slaveholding yep. territories, right. islands right. in the Caribbean, yep. and then after the war, it's Alaska, and that's about it. Like we. <laughs> Right. Purchased Alaska. But I, I taught in graduate school with the legal and military historian Peter Karsten. Okay. And one thing that he would repeatedly argue in the course was that US foreign policy going back very far into the 1840s was mainly about uh, using the Navy to expand markets mm -hmm. uh, for American producers. Right. And um, I mean, this goes, you know, things like, it usually takes the form of bombarding a coastline, right, with with cannons, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, like in Japan or Korea. Yes, um, you open or threatening to, right? Yeah, you yeah, open yeah. a country by yes. by uh, showing them how great your cannons are by throwing a volley off to the sea. Yes, uh, <laughs> a friendly demonstration. Can you give us sort of a, a tour of uh, what what you think of that argument or the progression of how the navy was used, sort of a, a front line for the interests of American corporatism. Right. It's it's funny you bring that up because I I don't talk about it that much in the book, um, and which is doubly ironic because I you know I served in the Navy, so I would I do care and know about these things. It just didn't happen to bring it up as much. But by the time I m focus on it, it's into the era of the um, the the real uh, Pacific expansion. So the debate over Hawaii and then the Spanish American War, um, and the sense that this is what great nations do. So Alfred Thayer Mahan in 1890 um, sort of fashions a narrative around American greatness that requires the United States, now that it has essentially consolidated its control over the territory, the contiguous continent, um, how can it achieve greatness? What's the next step? And the next logical step, as far, as far as he is concerned, using Great Britain as his model, is naval expansion, is to spread the, the power of the United States Navy well beyond the shores, right? So this isn't just about, and this gets to your point about using the Navy as a vehicle for opening markets. Well, this is in an era in which markets are closed or, or they are privileged. There's a privileged access for the various empires that sort of carve out these blocks under mercantilism and sort of, you know, sort of, uh, if not completely exclude um, um, other uh, others from trading there, at least set the, the terms of trade so that it's just so dis it's, it's, it's such a great advantage to them and a disadvantage to everyone else. And so the United States, I think, for part of this period felt compelled to play that game uh, along the same terms. But there was also, um, and then this started to evolve in, in England as well, there was starting to be sort of a road erosion of this sense that that's how you become wealthy is by closing off access to others. In fact, there was a greater uh, desire, I think, among many people to to break open these, these various trading blocks. But of course, that wouldn't happen for a very, very long time. So mostly what I focus on the book is the territorial expansion that came uh, around the time of the Spanish-American War in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, but you're absolutely right that there's another part of the story which I don't talk as about, about as much, which is the relationship between the Navy and, and commercial interests uh, uh, trading around the world. Now, before we leave the subject, I just have to note that once again, the horrible John C. Calhoun was always a fan of, of building up the Navy and dredging waterways and using government resources to improve rivers, rivers and harbors. 
mainly because it was in the Southern interests and right. the interests of, of uh, slaveholders to uh, bring their crops to market. The next stage of that is just pushing the Navy out to, mm -hmm. to bombard coastlines in other countries. And now speaking of things that great nations do, um, I was, I was uh, discussing this with somebody at a, at a conference recently um, that I, I believe it was under Grover Cleveland that the United States participated in the Berlin Conference that okay. partitioned Africa okay. and recognized King Leopold's Belgian Congo. Right. Which killed about no, twelve yes. million yes. Africans, right. all told, I believe, uh, producing rubber eventually. I mean, that misery. is so, and, producing and misery mostly. But yes, the, yes, the the person I was talking to was like, "Well, what was he supposed to do?" I mean, right. you know, that's sort of that's the way it was. That's done. what presidents yeah. do, right? right? You can't really fault him for that too much. Uh, I mean, Cleveland, uh, I, I know a bit about him and I've learned more about him, you know, doing this, doing this work. Um, you're right. I think that what was the alternative? The United States was wanted to be a, a player on the, on the global stage. And one of the ways you did that was be, you know, participate in these sorts of, of dialogues. Um, and there's only so much you could do in sort of pushing it in a different direction, it seems to me. So I guess you could, with anyone, with any American president, frankly, you could, you could pull out examples that in retrospect, uh, don't look very pleasant. And I agree, this is one of the, you know, certainly not one of the more, more pleasant aspects of, of, uh, Cleveland. Uh, career, uh, but at other times, you know, his I think his his position with respect to Hawaii is is a commendable one, and um, he resisted for lots of different reasons. Um, uh, and, and he also was much more committed to principles of free trade than, than were fashionable at the time. Um, so, so I guess, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a more than mixed bag. I think he's a, he's one of the better ones, uh, in that period. You know, it, now that I think about it, it, it might have been just before his presidency. But either one, you know, <laughs> whether it was him or his predecessor, uh, it's that whole era of foreign policy and these sorts of events get overlooked b because exactly what you said that, you know, there's the sense that, well, this is just sort of how – a this great nation done. acts, yeah, and right, if we're moving, right. if we're in this great transition from a second-rate power that's you know scrapping with the British for our own existence, mm -hmm. right. uh, trying to get up to that great power status, I mean, this is just the sort of thing you have to do. You have to go to big international conferences like this and at least participate, right? Make and, an appearance, right? Um, and as I recall, there was plenty of arm twisting going on and whining and dining of the American delegates to get their to get their support, get their buy-in, and. Yeah. You know, uh, this this then leads me into our our final uh, document for the for the week here, which comes from William Graham Sumner. This this famous essay of his on uh, the conquest of the United States by Spain, and you know he was certainly horrified at what it means to be a great power. Right. To give us give us some background on Sumner. Well, very much in the in along the lines of what we just said. I mean, Sumner. Speaking at a time that the, the Spanish American War has occurred, so this is January of, of 1899, and the you know the war ends quickly, and then the United States is suddenly sort of thrust into this status as you know we have graduated to great power status. We have we have sort of you know conferred this death blow. It appears to the Spanish Empire, which was you know sort of decrepit by that stage anyway. Um, and and this speech is sort of a cry, um, uh, to, uh, you know, that we do not make ourselves great in the way that the empires of the past made themselves great by lording over other peoples. That's just not how it's done. And um, <laughs> and it it's a remarkable speech because there are so many elements of it that are that are so resonant even today. There are passages that would sound so familiar to anyone who sort of looked at American foreign policy over the last 20 years and and asked and asked themselves how did we get here and I think that's exactly what Sumner was saying in 1899 how did we get here what happened to us as a people that we forgot what it was that actually made this country special and unique and now we are just simply adopting the same principles of um, of greatness that we rejected uh, for much of our history the conquest of the United States by Spain. I have no doubt that the conservative classes of this country will yet look back with great regret to their acquiescence in the events of 1898 
and the doctrines and precedents which have been silently established. Let us be well assured that self-government is not a matter of flags and Fourth of July orations, nor yet of strife to get offices. Eternal vigilance is the price of that as of every other political good. The perpetuity of self-government depends on the sound political sense of the people, and sound political sense is a matter of habit and practice. We can give it up, and we can take instead pomp and glory. This is what Spain did. She had as much self-government as any country in Europe at the beginning of the 16th century. The union of the smaller states into one big one gave an impulse to her national feeling and national development. The discovery of America put into her hands the control of immense territories. National pride and ambition were stimulated. Then came the struggle with France for world dominion, which resulted in absolute monarchy and bankruptcy for Spain. She lost self-government and saw her resources spent on interests which were foreign to her, but she could talk about an empire in which the sun never set and boast of her colonies, her gold mines, her fleets and armies and debts. She had glory and pride mixed, of course, with defeat and disaster, such as must be experienced by any nation on that course of policy. And she grew weaker in her industry and commerce, and poorer in the status of the population all the time. She has never been able to recover real self-government yet. If we Americans believe in self-government, why do we let it slip away from us? Why do we barter it away for military glory as Spain did? There is not a civilized nation which does not talk about its civilizing mission just as grandly as we do. The English, who really have more to boast of in this respect than anybody else, talk least about it. But the Pharisaism with which they correct and instruct other people has made them hated all over the globe. The French believe themselves the guardians of the highest and purest culture, and that the eyes of all mankind are fixed on Paris, whence they expect oracles of thought and taste. The Germans regard themselves as charged with a mission, especially to us Americans, to save us from egoism and materialism. The Russians in their books and newspapers talk about the civilizing mission of Russia in language that might be translated from some of the finest paragraphs in our imperialistic newspapers. The first principle of Mohammedanism is that we Christians are dogs and infidels, fit only to be enslaved or butchered by Muslims. It is a corollary that wherever Mohammedanism extends, it carries in the belief of its votaries the highest blessings, and that the whole human race would be enormously elevated if Mohammedanism should supplant Christianity everywhere. To come last to Spain, the Spaniards have for centuries considered themselves the most zealous and self-sacrificing Christians, especially charged by the Almighty on this account to spread true religion and civilization over the globe. They think themselves free and noble leaders in refinement and the sentiments of personal honor, and they despise us as sordid money-grabbers and heretics. I could bring you passages from peninsular authors of the first rank about the grand role of Spain and Portugal in spreading freedom and truth. Now each nation laughs at all the others when it observes these manifestations of national vanity. You may rely upon it that they are all ridiculous by virtue of these pretensions, including ourselves. The point is that each of them repudiates the standards of the others, and the outlying nations which are to be civilized hate all the standards of civilized men. We assume that what we like in practice and what we think better must come as a welcome blessing to Spanish Americans and Filipinos. This is grossly and obviously untrue. They hate our ways. They are hostile to our ideas. Our religion, language, institutions, and manners offend them. They like their own ways, and if we appear amongst them as rulers, there will be social discord in all the great departments of social interest. The most important thing which we shall inherit from the Spaniards will be the task of suppressing rebellions. If the United States takes out of the hands of Spain her mission, on the ground that Spain is not executing it well, and if this nation in its turn attempts to be schoolmistress to others, it will shrivel up into the same vanity and self-conceit of which Spain now presents an example. To read our current literature, one would think that we were already well on the way to it. Now the great reason why all these enterprises which begin by saying to somebody else, we know what is good for you better than you know yourself, and we're going to make you do it, are false and wrong is that they violate liberty, or to turn the same statement into other words, the reason why liberty of which we Americans talk so much is a good thing, is that it means leaving people to live out their own lives in their own way. 
while we do the same. If we believe in liberty as an American principle, why do we not stand by it? Why are we going to throw it away to enter upon a Spanish policy of dominion and regulation? And that's where we'll pick up next week. Our greatest thanks to Chris Preble, who has a PhD in history from Temple University. And be sure to check out his latest book, this one published right here at libertarianism.org, Peace, War, and Liberty, Understanding U.S. Foreign Policy. Thanks for listening. Liberty Chronicles is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Liberty Chronicles, please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.